Hi and welcome everyone to the next AI42 event, the panel discussion about how AI changes the world. I'm so excited to be here back online again. It's been a while, right, Kosha and Hoken? Yes, yes, we are very busy, but we wanted to back with this panel discussion and ask our panelists what AI and how AI changing core based on last changes. Yes, I think Hoken would a, like to go into details there. Yeah, uh, I was just saying, I think it's a very, very big, big topic and interesting topic, especially, you know, taking into account maybe the last six months explosion of both, you know, chat GPT and, uh, and GitHub Copilot and, and a lot of other things. So, uh, so I think we are in for a really interesting evening here. Yeah, I agree. And as you mentioned, it was like, a it's like you said, like a bomb, like an explosion. And I really hope that this panel will be like an explosion as well. So how about inviting our panels to talk speakers? Yes. Yeah, so I can, let me invite our first uh, panel, um, panel speaker here is uh, Emily Lundblad, who is the Managing Director for MS The Next Bridge. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Hoken, Gosha, and Eve. It's a pleasure. Do you want to uh, share a little bit about your background? Sure. So um, I've been working with data for the past 12 years. Uh, I started like everybody else with trying to pull out data from systems and put it into Excel and then figuring out that wasn't a database. And then from there, I learned how to create databases, how to create the uh, integrations. And that went on to become a online startup where we had a lot of products online. And that opened my eyes to the world of data online and what could be possible and also to the need to learn machine lo modeling or machine machine learning. So then I did a, a candidate, um, which was in quantitative um, math and econometric statistical modeling. And after that, I've been uh, working as a consultant within data and AI for the past seven years, mostly focusing on Microsoft. And for that, I've now become Microsoft MVP, which was uh, the delight for me this month. Um, and Hogan, thank you also for nominating me this year to HyperWrite's uh, Data and AI 100. So that was also uh, great. I've also done a minor in machine learning and AI from MIT, and I am right now finishing my master in IT management at the Danish ITU, where I'm writing my thesis on generative AI. So that's a bit about me. And then I have a small corgi called Molly and a cat called Charlie, and uh, spend a lot of time working. <laughs> yes. Wow, what a story. <laughs> nice. Welcome, Emily. So how about inviting our next speaker, who is Sebastiano Galazzo, who leads teams focused on research and development of new AI and machine learning solutions. Welcome, Sebastiano. Would you like to share a few stories about the projects you work on and more about yourself? You're muted, Sebastiano. <laughs> I think you are still uh, muted. Is the double mute? Is there? How can can you see something in the studio? Yeah, sorry. Now it works. <laughs> so it happens sometimes. Well, I was telling that uh, I deal with artificial intelligence and computer vision since 25 years now. So I guess that I gained uh, a bit of experience that uh, allowed me to win uh, free AI awards. Thanks for the research. But for me, it's also a passion. And uh, the last year, I'm working on uh, digital twins. So maybe you remember the episode of Black Mirror. So creating yourself, uh, your digital copy to interact with. And uh, this is my main project now. 
Of course, I use uh, generative AI and all kinds of uh, algorithms related to deep learning, uh, computer vision, embeddings, uh, everything. Yes, and I heard about this, uh, the Maestro AI. Yes, uh, the Maestro AI is an architecture that uh, we invented with our team that basically comes from the idea to save cost. <laughs> because uh, as a CTO, uh, we are fascinated by the last technologies, uh, of course, so OpenAI, ChatGPT, but everybody uh, looks just uh, to the video on YouTube about uh, the YouTuber uh, showing how magic is it. And that's true. But when you come to real life and uh, you have to pay the bills, you realize that uh, uh, could be very expensive if you run a real business. Because uh, for you, if you look at uh, the cost of a uh, very big prompt because uh, again if we are not playing of course but, uh, it could cost uh, two cents two cents uh, could be nothing but multiplied by uh, 1000 uh, 10000 queries per day guys uh, it's a very huge cost so the goal of maestro ai is uh, to use uh, let's say all the technologies all the it means uh, six months ago <laughs> in our world of course but combined in a smart way uh, we can reach the same results saving cost so maestro ai what this does basically is an ai that manages other ais so controls um I, I, is other AIs, so the goal is instead to use a very big, large language model, something smaller, controlled by another AI, and that allowed us to save cost. That's my story. AI. Wow, that's re that really sounds amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. So, Gosha, why don't you invite our next speaker? Yes, sure. So, our next uh, panelist is Robert Mulsov. He's a chief evangelist at Context AI, Microsoft MVP, and specialist in Office 365. Can you yeah, well, tell a little more about yourself? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm uh, really happy being here, so thank you for having me. And you had a very great introduction already. So uh, just to add, um, I, I'm really digitally addicted, I would say. So everything that's new, it's, uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic and I think it brings something positive for us and for the human being. And yeah, especially I'm, I'm brainwashed with Microsoft since 15, 20 years now. So it's just that I'm coming from this ecosystem being also MVP in this field. And yeah, what brings me to AI actually, so I'm, I'm working for Context AI. So what are we doing? So we look with technology, so with artificial intelligence, we look into the context of users, how they learn, how they uh, improve their career. So you can measure what people are doing good, what, what they are not doing that good. And based on this, uh, you can then tailor a learning experience and then really measure what kind of learning has a better impact, was that a worse impact and so on and so forth. So with technology, with artificial intelligence, we can achieve so much more even as humans. So we don't have to fear it. We should just use it. And this is what we are doing, and we're doing this, this e-coaching. So we are in the business of ed, ed tech. And yeah, um, with that, I'm happy to share now my experience. And one personal thing, I would say I'm also a pro professional ice cream tester. Not with a diploma, I'm just loving ice cream. I'm eating so much, so that's why I would say I have some, some skills there. <laughs> yeah, that's so lovely. and. For sure, learning with AI, it will be much, much easier and better to just explore the world for everyone. And we have the last uh, speaker. It's uh, Stephanie Locke. She is ex-AI MVP, now currently working in Microsoft. Could you tell a little more about yourself, Steph? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm currently working at Microsoft, uh, coming up a year and a half. Um, I'm masquerading in, in the software space, in app innovation, as we help put in AI into all the things. Before that, um, very much a data person, 
started very similarly to Emily of uh, had data in Excel, needed more data, do more things, learned SQL, worked my way from there. Um, and quite early on, realized that there was a point to my statistic, uh, to the statistics when, when I was in high school and, and college that it was uh, much more useful when you just weren't just using like a chi-square table for 30 people's heights in your class. Seeing 8 million customers and being able to work out how you can make a positive difference in their lives was when data science and statistics really kind of kicked in for me. Um, since then, I've done all sorts of things. And most recently, before joining Microsoft, trying to get AI into the hands of manufacturers uh, using a lot of Microsoft's brilliant technology, um, but failing at the big hurdle of them being in the cloud. Um, so it was a big lesson that I learned uh, over the past few years is that um, we need AI inside software, inside our day-to-day -day tools, but we also need to help bring uh, the benefits of the cloud more generally to more smaller, medium businesses for them to be able to own, build, and get value out of AI that is completely within their control. Um, oh, um, and I have three dogs. <laughs> Obi, Leia, and Dobby. Um, and you may hear Leia snoring behind me, depending on how loud she gets with this. <laughs> yeah, so you have a very great experience in all statistics, AI, and yes, you are a great person for today's debate. <laughs> yes, so welcome everyone. And I think it can, can I ask the first question? <laughs> and so, uh, before before we start, we can also okay. say that you know to the audience that you're very welcome here to come with your own questions. So just post any question that you have mm. in the in the chat. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Hokan. Yes, yes, because we can ask anything from the panelists today, and remember <laughs> that it means anything really. So let me start with the first question, please, everyone. Could you please share some of your experience you had with generative AI? Um, so when I was running my startup, I was technologist, CEO, and wearing all the different hats and also needing to do our marketing. And as you can imagine, I had very little free time. Um, and I actually started using AI to even just like simplify my marketing experience. So I had AI helping me write my blog posts. And then once I'd published the blog post, I had automation that would put, uh, that would uh, trigger another AI service that would read my blog mm -hmm. post and be able to draft a video summarizing it and put in all the stock videos. Uh, and be able to produce that so then I could post that on YouTube and be able to get things done. Um, so even just that, like throughout my day to day, we'd use AI to try and generate voiceovers and all, all the things that we could uh, simplify our day to day experience and make us more productive uh, and fight smarter as a startup. So I was very happy with how AI could make a difference as well as for my coding. Very cool, very familiar. <laughs> I think we're all so kind, we don't dare to speak out loud. So <laughs> I would say ladies first in this round when we talk about our experiences. Well, what would all you right. say? Thank you so much. Um, so for me, it really started about three, three and a half years ago when I joined WPP, the world's largest uh, marketing and media organization. I was working in the headquarters in the Nordics called Grubem. And we were working on helping some very big brands understand uh, customer behavior online. And for that, we were using from some of the first uh, larger language models. So first we started with BERT, then we used the Roberta, or the Roberta, there was also a Scandinavian version to understand what people were saying online. And then from there, we wanted to understand how did it relate to the pictures that, and how did people react to it. 
And then I actually became part of the innovation team across EMEA. And there we worked a lot with generative AI for generating images and video because it costs a lot of money to create an advertising picture or a video. And if you can create even just the start of it to test it on customers or users, that is a lot cheaper. So we had an example where somebody had created a, a commercial for a car and it was the wrong commercial and we'd spend 5 million Danish crowns or more on this commercial and it wasn't the right one. And that really kickstart that we wanted to be able to create generative um, AI videos and also images, but also have the understanding of what is in the video, what is in the image and how are people reacting to it. Um, from there on, it, it went into also generating text and using it for dynamic advertisement. Um, and, and then I went on to work with the uh, Amazon Expertage and there we were using similar technology, also uh, large language models. We used it uh, for similar purposes for some of the big Nordic um, companies that do brand surveil surveillance. And then from there, it went on to a big project with the fact-checking organization in Norway called um, Faktis.no, where we're actually using generative AI to understand all the news that are coming out, prioritize them, but also figure out if... Um, uh, if we can fact check them and how to fact check them. And that's how we got started on working with all the open AI models. And it opened our eyes really to what can you do with whisper when it comes to transcripting what people are saying, even in the parliament in Norway, uh, what can be done with clip to comparing images and text, what can actually be done uh, in order to make generative text better at fact checking or reasoning. And so this became a whole journey on its own. And from there, I've been doing uh, so many talks and working with it and it just exploded. And now every day is generative AI. Uh, I've been teaching WPP how to use GitHub Copilot. I've been teaching them how to use uh, DALI, OpenAI in Asia. Um, so, uh, it's gone into being both the voice and images and text and coding. Um, and I can't see a day go by without working with generative AI. So it's it's been an amazing work journey and a bit like a, a rocket ship this year, really. I agree with you. You can do so much more with AI, actually, with this generative AI to do yeah, get things done. Let's call it this way, uh, especially when you mentioned this coding. Uh, and let me pick up my story also, because as I said, uh, it's about uh, education as well. And um, we also have code, so we write code for, for our AI. And uh, when, when our developers tried it out, uh, ChatGPT, how it works. And sure, there's this normal thing here, um, tell me how to create a team, what to do or something like this. This is super easy. But when we go into code, you know these examples, write me code of something. But take the other perspective. So explain me something. This is what they started. So they copied some code, what, what we wrote into this and asked ChatGPT, explain me, what is this code doing? And our developers were so uh, amazed. This is so right. We, we couldn't make it even better to, to make comments on this. So it's really great. They used it. And sure, there were a couple of commandlets that are available across different uh, repositories and um, libraries in, in the internet and so on and so forth. But, and this was um, the great thing, um, we also wrote our own commandlets our own special procedures. And even for those things, which are actually not in the internet, but we just provided it, hey, explain me what this thing is doing. Even this was correctly anticipate, uh, anticipating what these special procedures are doing, what our own commandlets are doing. So, and this was kind of, wow, what can generative AI do for us to really help us learning understand complex things. And this was um, for us kind of an eye opener, um, what we want to build on. Well, what to say, you are everybody <laughs> fan of Copilot. Uh, from my <laughs> side, instead, just to start uh, a discussion, I'm not a big fan of Copilot because uh, it's also true that it is amazing from one side, there's no doubt. But also, I see mistakes uh, every day with the generative AI that could be uh, generating languages, uh, text, uh, or images. And so, again, as a CTO, uh, not always <laughs> I would be so confident to use uh, uh, suggestion text uh, coming from this kind of tool. Uh, 
because uh, as you know they tell you like it was uh, the truth coming from even and uh, sometimes you believe on that so if we generate uh, uh, a sentence uh, maybe is not that uh, wonderful in our chat uh, some, some, sometimes is not cool but anyway if the mistake is inside the, our code uh, could be more painful so i don't want to say do, do not use copilot this is not the, the message but also that uh, we must be aware and still use our head uh, i guess that uh, we are still not so ready to be uh, to, to trust at 100 percent this kind of tools absolutely and i don't think i think I would actually be worried when it gets close enough that it is that it feels like 100% accurate because right now it makes errors frequently enough or isn't as good fit enough that people hopefully stay aware that you know it's an assistant it's not a replacement because we should be spending the time on the problem definition on making sure that we build the, the right kind of pseudo code or uh, framing for a solution and then use copilot to help us get to that solution more quickly as opposed to try as opposed to uh, just allowing copilot to write the whole thing for us without us putting that human in the loop to say is this the right thing so yes we need to make sure that uh our devs, our BI developers, and all of us don't get lazy and just start accepting it as the truth and 100% accurate. Yeah, laziness is dangerous always. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Yep, we should definitely learn to be more critical with whatever we get there to then also value can this be right or not and i'm not talking about fake news also but in general when mm -hmm. ai is generating something for us we we still need the skills to understand could this be right or or not and this is something we really need to be aware of and it's a skill think, people yeah. should hopefully have been getting when using stack overflow um and Act, you know, search on GitHub, but it's something that we should definitely reinforce. And uh, I think this is a nice, uh, nice segue here into our next question here, uh, because you know, right now, you know, OpenAI and Copilot and these type of technologies are everywhere around us. It seems and it's used in many types of different services. It can be both be used from anything from generating a text to school assignment or just design a building and many types of use cases. But the question is, how can we actually use these technologies in a responsible way? Uh, when I can pick this uh, directly up here, um, because how to be responsible means like um, to, to, to use it in a good way. And um, yeah, what we just heard is um, that not, not everything is correct. And uh, when I look around also when other people write articles and so on, all those people are also can be biased, for example. I, I remember one article which was from this user totally against Microsoft, therefore whatever Microsoft's doing, it's bad. But this was officially in the public television, for example. So I wouldn't say that it was responsibly from, from this from this guy. And this is the same with technology and with, with artificial intelligence, that um, this can be biased, um, but we have to be critical of this. And to use it responsibly is I would like to treat not only technology, so everybody, but also technology in a good way. I should have good good manners or good good reasons why to use it to support me. Um, and uh, I, I think when, when the world is changing to that way, that we only want positive things, um, then we automatically use it maybe responsibly, That's my opinion. So I think if, from an academic point of view, we always, uh, the one, of, one of the first things we learn is to think critically and to question whether something is true. And I think that is really important when using generative AI. 
So far, I haven't seen any solution, whether for code or for generating text where it's picture perfect. If I look at the work that's being done at the moment at the AI Pioneering Center, it's all about being better at explaining the reasoning, understanding where information is coming from, understanding how to improve the logic and also make it more correct. But I haven't seen any solutions where it's a good idea not to have a human in the loop, whether it's for writing articles, ad forms, or it's writing code. Also, it doesn't always, even if you're prompted really well, it doesn't always understand the context. A very easy example is if you're using your GitHub Copilot, it doesn't know your environment necessarily. So it doesn't always know what will be working in what Python environment and what won't be working. So I think critical thinking is the number one thing I advocate. Check the facts, check your code, check the references and what it's writing. And then uh, don't really trust it. It's, that's not where we're at. And I agree completely with Stephanie. That's also a very good thing uh, because where would the where would the work go? Um, so it is a co-pilot. It's helping us, you know, to get there faster, but not necessarily do the work. Yes, for sure. So talking about uh, school assignment, for example, I guess uh, that uh, the responsibility um, is in both sides. So uh, I believe that uh, is a tool, uh, for example, a chat GPT, and uh, like a tool, uh, of course, uh, must help you. Well, uh, I consider uh, the school like a gym so uh, it means uh, that uh, mm, I, I, a gym for your brain for your future well if you cheat and uh, you use a tool just to pass the exams with a high uh, score uh, anyway <laughs> uh, said that the life uh, <laughs> will be honest uh, more uh, some some days so because uh for example at the university there were a lot of great guys with the high scores that uh, were able to repeat ev everything just uh, using memory but understood nothing so if you use this kind of tool uh, not understanding uh, what you are studying it's your fault in my opinion and uh, and that easy to create a test a, a solution uh, to understand if you really know what you studied so uh, it's not the, a fault uh, of open ai of course in this case i, I guess uh, but uh, mm -hmm. again maybe laziness of or maybe that of, of teacher of that they are still not ready uh, to this kind of tools but it's possible uh, to understand uh, if someone uh, really understood what uh, he studied or not that is uh, that he used and if he used the open ai to understand that's okay in my opinion but I think it's up to school sorry yeah I, I think plagiarism and kind of rotes uh, using chat gpt are going to be a challenge for us for a while but I think it's partly how we think about education. You know, previously access to the details, to the facts of how things work could only be passed on through books and one-to-one uh, -one teaching. School these days could be more about preparing you for problem solving and being able to learn things more yeah, rapidly. Great. And, and bringing your own critical thinking and opinions and deriving novel conclusions. Right now, we force people to have the same academic style, dry academic style, to build papers the same way, to bring, to, to not bring their own authentic person to knowledge and, and to things. So we can change how we do education so that whether ChatGPT writes something or not matters less than the skills they employed to write it, to, to uh, capture it. Absolutely. And, I agree. and on yeah. that note, there has been a very interesting um, research paper from MIT looking into the impacts of actually using generative AI for writing. 
and where you do see that people get higher grades for writing essays and they do become more productive. So they're better at matching this style that you mentioned, the academic style of essays or, or writing papers, but they still have to do the critical thinking of is this the correct theory? Am I applying it correctly? And there you can never, you can't trust ChatGPT to fully understand uh, any of the implications of scientific theories. And it's really important to focus your time then on understanding that, understanding how to apply it. But I, I think it might be uh, useful that you also get a, a help to actually write even better. Uh, I sure would like uh, academic papers that was more well written and easier to read, but that might just be me. Yeah, I, I think it will be good to ask here because we have this old copilot, we have in the code, we have now coming to Office 365 where we can generate more and more. We have Power BI, Word, Excel, etc. So who copyright all of the text was generated or code generated? I think we need here clear governance guidelines, especially when talking about GitHub. Um, you can you simply publish your content. It depends. So if you have a private GitHub, then not. But uh, when something is public, it should be available for everyone. And then and also the uh, the copilot and, and uh, other language models should benefit from this to inspire others again to build then even the next one based on this. So in my opinion, we should have their real clear guideline also for this different models that are trained on data. Can this data be used for training or not? And this must be really written down or in whatever form we have it, but we should then really align with those kind of governance rules. Yes, but I guess that it depends on the case, because if I'm talking about art, uh, I can understand that as artist, uh, I could be uh, not happy uh, that my work uh, is used for training. But uh, if talking about code, in my opinion, for example, is not so that different than uh, uh, cut and paste from Stack Overflow, just changes the, the tool. That uh, in this in, in one case uh, we have the old style website, but on, on the other case uh, a, a tool that is newer, but uh, doesn't change. So nobody says uh, uh, that code that work uh, is mine and put it in, into Stack Overflow. Uh, of course, again, it's different if we if if it's music or if it's uh, art. I guess that we need to separate the different cases. I agree. When you have it on Stack uh, Overflow, then it's should depending on the license, but then it's publicly available. And therefore, um, from a governance perspective, I would say, okay, I now provided it, it can be used. If I don't want that it can be used, then I should not make it publicly available on those portals. Or it should be kind of fine-grained permission control or whatever. Uh, just my my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I think we we very much kind of rap so rapidly moved into this new area of technology that our licensing and a pro, you know AI generative AI is a completely unforeseen use case for the use of. Uh, data that uh, code that's MIT licensed or um, GPL and things and we we do need to think collectively around open source how do we better approach um, our code as something whether it goes into lang uh, large language models or not and then we also kind of continuing my theme of personal responsibility you know where businesses and individuals were adopting a new technology that we're finding the new use cases, finding the edges for it every day. And so we need to be thinking very critically about where are our risks, where are our value, and how do we manage and mitigate that risk um, to be able to use it appropriately. Because we should never remove risk, but we should always manage risk as an organization. Yeah, well said. It's maybe also about, I'm not sure if it's fit, but democratizing uh, data and democratizing knowledge. And this is also a decision. So, hey, I, I 
got inspired from, from other developments, from, from other code, from other whatever. Um, and maybe I also want to inspire back or the other way around and so on and so forth. But certain things, of course, it's corporate identity of, of, of companies. And keep it in your company then, because this is your, uh, your CIA then uh, in, in the competition. Um, but for, for some general information and uh, yeah, whatever you think um, it's worth to share with the world, we should more think into that direction to really move the world, to the, the human beings forward, and not only think about ourselves uh, uh, company type, while keeping the CIA, of course. So that, that's all. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's about balancing, as you well said. So. Yes, uh, uh, also I guess that uh, we need to separate uh, knowledge from uh, our point of view because uh, often they are mixed because, uh, for example, uh, we can create, uh, we, we, we believe that the knowledge is um, clear, clean, uh, but uh, you can create uh, something uh, related uh, Leonardo da, da Vinci with uh, his history, but also adding your critical view. So in this case, uh, in your opinion, is uh, something that uh, owns to you or uh, is common knowledge? Because it, it changes adding uh, something coming from you. So I think it's a difficult area and we definitely need more legislation, especially when it comes to, you know, how much should be shared. On the other hand, looking at the history of innovation, we do see that the more knowledge sharing that has been done, the more value is created in society. And if we just look at Wikipedia today, nobody questions whether or not we should share all that knowledge. That being said, the most problematic I'm seeing at the moment is when you're creating songs, videos, pictures that looks like a specific individual, looks like a model, looks like an actor, sounds like an actor. Mm -hmm. So the protection of individual traits and individual uh, thinking and your identity, that is something I'm very worried about. And I really would like to see some legislation addressing this area. Yeah, in this case, uh, I guess that it's easier. Uh, it's far away more difficult when it comes uh, to ideas. Because uh, we can talk uh, uh, together uh, about the same thing, about World War II and uh, including uh, different point of view. So the knowledge is the same, but mixed with our ideas, uh, change the content. And so in this case, uh, we don't have the same protection tools uh, like songs uh, or images. And uh, right today, at uh, this day, I can't see a solution for that. Maybe it will come uh, in a few months, I don't know. Uh, but I have to say that in my opinion today, there's no way to protect if you want. Uh, this kind of knowledge. I, ho I hope there is, because otherwise, one of the things that I love the most about Copilot and GitHub, but also ChatGPT, is that it adapts to what I've been doing. It learns from me. You can see very clearly that GitHub Copilot learns from your coding style and the languages you normally use, and that's great. But as it learns everything I do and all my processes and my thinking, I'm also wondering how much of that will be shared with the rest of the world. And you know, to how large a degree can my way of working be copied in the future? So for me, it's a double-edged sword where I'm, I'm wondering if Copilot is in all the products that I use all the time, can you create a digital version of me that can start working for the company and I can just leave or, which is great, but creepy, but, who owns all my work that has gone into a generative AI model? So that, that's a, a great question. Um, and it, in so like some of it, if you use like the open a, the Azure open AI uh, piece, then your data is ring fenced inside your own uh, solution. It doesn't get added to the, uh, it doesn't get in, added to the to the base model it stays within your tenants and things like that 
but there is the, the the solid question that links back to the fact that almost everybody in their contract has a question about the IP that we create day to day inside our company when we code when we write build things that IP belongs to the company and that actually can be something that your organization takes further and you know makes a work you potentially in future um that it, it's i know microsoft takes a strong stance against things that create uh, that have a high risk of injustice things like facial recognition um but certainly you know, there's lots and lots of organizations producing AI technologies right now. It's not infeasible that somebody uh, out there writes the digital you in the same way that when we had, when COVID hit, we had a surge in um, monitoring tools that said whether somebody was at the desk all day. Um, it's, a, it's a risk with the way that we write employment contracts and the way many executives think about their employees today. Thank you for that answer. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that uh, it was a great discussion. Thank you so much for all your viewpoints. And we have a question from the audience I would like to come up with right now. <laughs> Thank you. So. In your opinion, do you have any concerns about using ChatGPT or Copilot regarding data protection and GDPR? I think it perfectly aligns with what Emilia uh, said already. So uh, it helps us a lot, but where's this data going and what, what, what is made with this? Um, it's a kind of a trade-off. So it should help me, but I pay with my data on the other side. And um, I wouldn't say that we can't really have a concrete decision here or concrete opinion here because everybody is the owner of their own data and everybody should decide how much I'm able to give it away. And for now, we just need to trust that um, all the different companies who are running these large language models are really then protecting and keeping this data and in line with um, the GDPR regulations. So it's possible to even change. We, we saw this from Italy and then, uh, yeah, Microsoft did something or OpenAI was doing something. Um, but yeah, something we need to rely on these kind of um, uh, policies then. But many of our existing measures as organizations uh, who need to be conscious of our GDPR processing should hold whether it's uh, an AI program or a you know a SaaS product that you buy. You need to know how your people are interacting with that system uh, and inserting customer data into it. You need to understand contractually how the how your vendors are uh, consuming, storing, retaining, destroying that data. And you need to make sure that your con uh, contracts and GDPR notices for your, um, for your customers are up to date. So it is a compliance challenge, but I think it's a, com it's a compliance challenge that is known uh, and will be, you know, if you use a, an AI startup uh, it's you've probably got the same kind of compliance risks as a SaaS startup. Yeah. I am I'm surprised that a lot of people still don't understand that when you don't pay for a product, you're the product, and when you use the <laughs> open source browser chat, you can see every prompt you send in there is information that can be prompted back out by all the other users and i mean we've got the samsung case we've got cases from other companies i've even got some creepy examples of finding information about my my own boss so i i think people should be aware and, and this is what i tell all customers if it could in any way be gdpr sensitive do not put it into the chat gpt browser and especially now where we have the pl plugins that is actually third party um, companies and nobody can tell us exactly what's happening with the data and it can be also in countries that does not apply to the same rules. So here I would ask people to be very, very critical and very careful with what they're doing. 
when you're using the open AI models on Asia, it's a, a, a different scenario. It's within the bounds of your, your company. Uh, you can delete the models again. It's within your, your own firewall. So it's not the same issues you're not sharing with the rest of the world. But when you are using the browser chat GPT, you're sharing with the rest of the world and you don't know what they're going to do with the data. So I think it's, it's something that I want to keep highlighting and making people aware of and to be super critical of. And I do think we need more legislation in this area. And I think it was good that Italy highlighted the problem. Yeah, in fact, uh, I think that we are very lucky in Europe uh, having uh, GDPR and the uh, European uh, uh, community that uh, protect or at least try to do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, the truth is that uh, at, at the end, the best way to protect yourself is your behavior. Mm. Because uh, as you said, if you load a company document inside uh, OpenAI, guys, there's no way that they don't use uh, for training. And that's dangerous. So basically, you don't do that. I read an article two days ago uh, I don't. I haven't double checked, but I guess that uh, should be true. Uh, that uh, Google said to their to their own employer, uh, "Don't use Bard because it's public." So it's the same company that avoids using this kind of tool. Uh, of course, sharing uh, very important documents. So uh, again. Uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, at the end, uh, you can claim uh, to protection, uh, uh, laws, uh, tools, uh, but you must be aware of these new technologies uh, and uh, it's up to you. Yeah. I mean, even Apple is blocking that people can use ChatGPT and many banks are, so there is a huge issue here. Yes, but I can't uh, can believe that people that uh, anyway uh, okay, they don't have uh, our technology background, but um, may, for sure I'm wrong, of course. But I guess that uh, uh, you work in an office, uh, everybody turned on uh, a laptop, a PC, uh, you heard about the chat GPT everywhere. So it's unbelievable that you are, there are so many people that are not aware of the risk of sharing uh, internal knowledge with uh, this tool. Well, what to say, uh, maybe that it's um, clear for you, but for the audience, uh, uh, for people, I heard a sentence that uh, uh, was like that. If is it free or cheap, the product is you. So keep in mind that uh, always. <laughs> Yes, and, and at the same time, we're also living in a world where we do have quite a lot of political tensions. We are seeing uh, hacker attacks that are politically motivated. So it's also not a world where you should trust that all users of ChatGPT have good intentions. Just doing one thing I want to clarify here. So these free solutions like ChatGPT or BART, um, sure, all this data goes into one repository to train and to learn and so on. So this is what the people should be aware of because you are the product, at least partly in this case, as in the uh, perfectly said. Um, but we should aim to also a, a way where each company can have their kind of own copy, their own uh, repository of of GPT, of BART, or whatever, and then this goes only into their own index and doesn't leave the boundaries of the company. And um, then, of course, you can use the advantages of these AI models and the power of AI without fearing that your data goes uh, somewhere. So, I mean, that's partly what you have with the open AI models on Azure where you can train your own GDP, uh, GPT-4, three and a half, or the models that you want. And to some extent, uh, now that you have the collaboration with Hugging Face in Machine Learning Studio, you can actually take a lot of the open source information and use it in a way that is um, in enterprise grade security. So I think that Microsoft's work in this area has made that possible or made it a lot more feasible for a lot of companies, which it wasn't 
six months ago or, or a year ago. And I think, you know, we're really going to have to, the, the risk of people putting data into chat GPT, personal, confidential, it's, we have a real problem with digital literacy. Like even, you know, in well-developed countries, people generally have a much lower level of awareness of their cybersecurity, their online safety, protections for children, uh, data, uh, data protect, um, you know, full, uh, content protection and things. That's a big gap. Uh, and, you know, even to the fact that people don't even realize sometimes video games have age ratings and um, put 18 rated, give 18 rated games to children. Um, and I think where AI, generative AI, is really going to bring this, continue bringing this to the forefront, that digital literacy is a core competency for the future. And we need it in schools, we need it for adults, and we need it for everybody in between. Um, because it's only going to get harder for people to live safely in a digital world without that basic literacy. I agree, but who do you think has the responsibility to increase the digital literacy across mm. nations? There is the risk when you say everyone's responsible that no one's responsible. Um, but I see organizing, you know, we have our personal responsibility to maintain our skills and, and to kind of look after ourselves. I, I know a number of uh, organizations, um, enterprise customers who who are aware that, uh, for instance, they might have low literacy rates inside their organization, uh, like um, core literacy, not just digital literacy. And so they have programs and initiatives and they structure their communications and things in a way to help tackle some of the literacy gap. And organizations, when they do their GDPR onboarding and annual security reviews and things like that, could be taking in to taking this into account. And similarly, schools and governments can organize it and provide uh, online literacy courses. I think Sweden did a great AI fundamentals a while back that uh, they the uh, that they gifted to the world uh, to, to get to help people understand what AI was about and its potential impacts. And we can do that. We can make things available uh, to help people. But now it looks like uh, OpenAI is the devil, but don't forget that we shared uh, with our queries on Google our data since 2000 or <laughs> even be before. And uh, so it's also correct to, to say that uh, he's not the only one is stealing our personal data and everything that we are saying about the open AI that now looks like uh, the bad guy is also true uh, for other companies. Uh, uh, so Google uh, maybe doesn't use as uh, open AI, of, yes, now as bad, but what it does with our data, I, I can't imagine. So I have to say in, the, in all the time I worked with, with the VPP and media and marketing uh, data, I wasn't really worried about Google's use of my data. It didn't creep me out. What creeped me out was the social media platforms and their algorithms, because it's once we understand people's behavior and their attention patterns that we can really affect what they do and how they think. And that scares me. And what scares me then about open AI's models is that it can fully understand how I think, how I ask questions, what I'm almost, it can almost predict what I'm going to do next. So it's once it understands our behavior and our attention patterns that it's scary, if that makes sense. And this is where I'm a bit worried about third world countries where they don't have a high uh, digital literacy. Do they understand what they're giving away? How much can we affect democracies in third world countries through these tools? That are, that are things that I, I'm, I'm worried about and I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it can be scary, the, but it can also be helpful. Uh, my turn. Uh, sorry, um, I got one last sentence. Um, because when we talk about um, advertising, which is also kind of understanding what we probably like, and I don't like to be honest, but others may like because they get a good offer, what they were searching for, or something. So it's it's a case by case decision. Um, yeah. In bad ways, it's bad, but it can also be helpful uh, when we get uh, understood better, also for mental health uh, scenarios where we can raise those questions. So I agree, but there is also a very good question over here uh, in the comments. And one of them is, imagine you have kids, what would you teach them about generative AI? And at least when I was working with media and marketing data, this was what worried me. It was seeing how young people's behavior was changing. You look to a 13-year-old girl today, they do not look like when I was 13 year old. Actually, they look closer to porn models when I was 13 than ever before. And this is advertisement. This is something that has been influenced by all the algorithms. And this scares me. It scares me what's happening with the younger generation, with their attention and with their perception of what they should be and what their life should be like. And so if I had a kid this age, I would be very confused whether or not to even allow them to use these tools on the other hand, I also understand that you have to, it's a competitive advantage for the future. So this is something I'd like to see politicians address. How do we actually pre protect the younger generations who do not have the critical ability to understand what they're doing yet? You mentioned earlier the risks of deep fakes and things. And I think that that's definitely an area where I can see a uh, huge potential for cyberbullying um, uh, and a lot of risk for young people. I s still, I think I'd probably be less worried about chat GPT and its impact on children than, as you say, about social media and the dopamine traps built in to, uh, to, to gamify their behaviors and to focus on likes and change, change how they present to the world. Uh, based on how social media drives their interactions. Yeah. But what's the really challenge? The same yeah. 20 because years ago about us. It's putting their <laughs> lives online in social media. You can understand their way of speaking and thinking. You can scrape that information. You can put it into ChatGPT and you can have it start generating a chat that they would respond to. And we're seeing increasing amount of mm. behavior in this direction. That creeps me out like access to IRC back in the day and the fact that anybody could get on and pretend to be a child. Now they can do it more convincingly. Yeah. Yeah. This is something we have to take, uh, take care um, to be, yeah, try to be ethical in this case and not only uh, to be critical, but also it's really on us as the humans to, um, bring these borders or to, to educate our children to use it in a good way, in a responsibly way, to really use it positively um, and not just here get teach by uh, um, GPT or something and I'm out and go for a beer or something like this. No, we should take this responsibly and really take and use this technology um, to uh, simply make more things possible. But if we just think, okay, these AI will now take over and will do everything for me, this is the exactly wrong approach. And this is what many people probably also worry and where the question comes, oh, will, will AI remove, uh, replace um, jobs and so on and so forth? Yes, definitely. But there are other opportunities, other chances to grow into. Um, there are new jobs that we have, and these opportunities we tease, we should uh, really take as an uh, yeah, open-minded people. Yes, but uh, I guess that also it's very, very easy for us uh, uh, to say we need to talk with our child uh, and uh, to teach how to manage these uh, technologies. But uh, we are privileged because uh, we work with technology. But I think uh, to a lot of tons of uh, friends, uh, mother of... Uh, uh, friends of my child that doesn't have this kind of knowledge. They understand nothing. They can't uh, teach. I, for example, uh, I was in front uh, of an ethical uh, uh, situation 
because I realized that, that uh, using AI, generative AI, is it possible to nudify people? Uh, I managed that tool and I said uh, I will never do a session talking about generative AI because uh, really uh, it was scary. But how many people know that it can be done or even that exist? So uh, it's not that easy to say we need to talk with other children. We can do that, but a lot of people doesn't know even that uh, something can be done. So how that people can teach them? And this is exactly the I question. I think also the responsibility. I like uh, to uh, to talk in the schools uh, with guys, uh, but of course uh, me, neither you uh, can save the the world. What is needed is uh, a massive approach in. Uh, spreading the voice uh, uh, and not just uh, some video on YouTube or some activities uh, uh, because really there are millions of people that <laughs> do nothing about that. They don't have the, the tools even if they want. I think that's probably the, point, the uh... biggest problem is uh, kids are often more technologically savvy than their parents. I remember yes, being, yes. like uh, eight and teaching my mother. Uh, their parents <laughs> that should teach to them. <laughs> so, uh, in, in which world uh, a kid uh, discover that there is a way to unify uh, a classmate and say to his father or his mom, Mom, look what I can do. And this is exactly so, the challenge. Technology is, is developing like this, but we can only learn like this or adapt to this only a little. And this is this is the thing we need to get in our minds that we really need technology to also learn that fast, to adopt to all these quick changes and uh, have these new ways of thinking. And this is so critical um, that we have to do. And I think just with our human thing, human brains, it's not possible. We need, um, uh, so, uh, no, no, the, the um, way of learning we had so far is not working on this um, because then uh, the impact um, will be too big because there will some who um, succeed and some who will not succeed, even worse than it, that is currently at the case. So I think this, the speed of the technological development is especially a challenge, a challenge for legal development. So we cannot develop the laws and the guidelines uh, fast enough to keep up with how fast AI and technology is developing. And so asking governments only to protect us is also not realistic. At the same time, we can also not teach our children fast enough. And, you know, what then? How is our own ethics and humanity going to help us? I can see that we could go on about this uh, topics for days. I would be so happy to sit together again sometime soon and, and continue this discussion. We have so many more questions to, to talk about, but uh, I am afraid that we need to close it now. Um, so. I hope uh, the audience also enjoyed it as, as much as uh, we did. We had a really, really important conversation going on here, and and I really can't wait to. We will share the questions with the with the panelists as well, and we will make sure that all the questions get answered. So um, please check back on AI for the two soon. Is there anything else that I should mention here, Hoken? No, I, I guess we can just wish. We will uh, or thank everyone here, both in the panel and everyone who turned up here in the audience, and also wish everyone a happy summer. Yes, thank you. It's been real. It's been uh, a pleasure to be here and thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you a lot again to Thanks our everyone. panelists as well. It was it was really really great to have you. It was it was amazing to thank hear you your much. opinions. Please uh, stay a little bit on the stream here after our final uh, things. Okay. So All right. Thank one. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Bye.